So welcome back to everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Resources Conservation and Recycling Webinar Program. It's great to have everybody here again. My name is Mitchell Jones. I will be your host for today and also the immediate future. Uh, I'm the Outreach Editor at Resources Conservation and Recycling. The program that you are here for today is an English language webinar program that is run every second Thursday at 10 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. The scope is broad. We, we cover the entire scope of the journal. And we aim to have accessible webinars that are interesting and uh, understandable for a broad audience. So we do ask our speakers to keep things uh, as accessible as possible for everybody. Registration is necessary. You can register using the links provided in the monthly newsletter, which is circulated at the end of each month. Or also, the, the links are also posted to the official RCR social media accounts and will also be posted on the RCR Al Xavier site in the near future. We have a capacity for 500 people in our virtual seminar room. If you cannot secure a position, <clears throat> You can always watch the live stream on YouTube, and you can also visit YouTube to see the previous webinars if you're interested at your leisure. The link is youtube.com forward slash RCR journal. The final point is that we do value your feedback at the start of, uh, beg your pardon, at the end of this webinar, you will receive the opportunity to leave some feedback for us. We are aiming to please, so, if you have any comments or any feedback on our webinars, we would love to hear it if you have the time. So to start us off, I will quickly touch on the program for today, which is same as usual. <laughs> if you've been here before, you will know the program. We've had the welcome address. We now will have the introduction to the journal and the introduction to the speaker. A uh, brief note on how things are going to operate today and also in the future, followed by a 20-minute presentation, 10 minutes of question times, and then a few notes on the next event and some closing remarks. So our journal has a broad scope. We're all about everything to do with resources, conservation, and recycling, systems-wide strategies, technological, economic, institutional policy focus, resource management practices conservation, recycling, resource substitution, resource productivity improvement, restructuring of production consumption profiles, and transformation of industry. Today, uh, all communication in English, please, as this is an English language program. So any questions, etc., please in English. We have closed captions currently operating. They seem to be working okay at the moment. Hopefully they stay that way. <clears throat> Feel free to post any questions that you might have during the webinar in the Q&A chat. We will be looking at them while well, addressing them in, in terms of prioritizing the most, most popular questions. So if you would like to upvote a question rather than asking it again, that would be great. Uh, if you wish to deliver your question verbally uh, with your camera or microphone, we can also accommodate that. You just need to raise your hand virtually using the raised hand um, reaction, and then we, we can allow you to come and speak as well. Uh, however, we will address the Q&A questions first, since everybody has the opportunity to upload what questions they find most interesting. So our speaker for today is um, Gazelle Azimi from the University of Toronto in Canada. She's going to be speaking to us on the application of supercritical fluid extraction to the recycling of waste, electronic, and well, being from electrical and electronic waste <clears throat> equipment. Sorry, there's a little uh, thing blocking some of the screen for me, so I may have missed a word there. Uh, Dr. Priscilla Zimi is a professor and Canada Research Chair in Urban Mining Innovations. She is jointly appointed by the Departments of Chemical Engineering and Applied Chemistry and Materials Science and Engineering at the University of Toronto. 
She received her PhD in 2010 from the Department of Chemical Engineering and Applied Chemistry at the University of Toronto. Before returning to the University of Toronto as a faculty member in 2014, she completed two postdoctoral appointments at MIT in the Departments of Material Science and Engineering and Mechanical Engineering. She has been recognized with several young researcher awards for excellence in research, teaching and leadership, namely Canada Research Chair Tier 2, Emerging Leaders of Chemical Engineering, Canadian Society for Chemical Engineering, the 2020 CSCHE Innovation Award, the 2020 TMS Young Leaders Award, Minerals, Metals and Materials Society, TMS. And this part I am not able to read because my closed captions are over it, but a, a wide range of distinctions. So um, it's my absolute pleasure and thank you so much for being here today to welcome uh, Giselle to the floor. I'll, uh, I'll pass you over to her now. Thank you, Giselle. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michelle, for the kind introduction and good day, everyone. I hope you are doing well. It's my great pleasure to be here today and present our results um, on extraction of critical materials using supercritical fluid extraction. Michelle, I cannot uh, start screen share because you are sharing. Oh, I think uh, it should have been solved now. Yes. It's working? Okay, great. Yes, it is working. Great. Uh, is everything clear? Yes, okay. Um, so today I'm going uh, to talk about application of supercritical fluid extraction for recycling of waste electrical and electronic equipment. My research at the Laboratory for Strategic Materials is at the intersection of process engineering, electrochemistry, and materials design. We look at extractive metallurgy of critical metals such as rare earth elements using pyro and hydrometallurgy. We also use supercritical fluid extraction for metal recovery. In terms of electrochemistry, we look at electro refining for direct decarburization of molten iron and development of aluminum batteries. And in materials design, we look at high temperature ceramics for uh, specialty applications and in extract and impregnated surfaces for solid liquid separation. One of the thrusts of my research uh, program is technospheric and urban mining of strategic materials. As for the field, we look at industrial waste such as red mud from aluminum industry, phosphogypsum from fertilizer industry, and slag from steel making. We also look at end-of-life products such as nickel metal hydride and lithium ion batteries, neodymium iron boron magnets, and fluorescent lamps. For extraction processes, we look at supercritical fluid extraction, hydrometallurgy, and hybrid hydropyrometallurgy. And we extract rare elements, gold, platinum group metals, niobium, titanium, cobalt, and nickel. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, recovery of lithium and cobalt from lithium ion batteries using supercritical fluid extraction. Conventional recycling techniques are based on pyrometallurgy or hydrometallurgy. Pyrometallurgy requires high energy input and high tem reaction temperatures and produces large volumes of greenhouse gas emissions. Also, value metals partition into the slag phase, which must be separated using hydrometallurgy. Therefore, hydrometallurgy is usually the more uh, preferred way. However, it uh, faces some challenges. For example, it requires large volumes of acids and organic solvents. It requires high operating and maintenance costs due to high corrosivity, and it generates large volumes of hazardous waste. Therefore, there is a need for an environmentally sustainable, cost-effective, and efficient uh, process for recycling of value metals from post-consumer uh, products. That brings us to supercritical fluid extraction. Supercritical fluid extraction, or SCFE, is an emerging green technology for the recovery of metals, particularly lanthanides and actinides. A material is called supercritical fluid if its temperature and pressure are raised above critical point where the boundary between the liquid and gas phases disappear and we get to a single fluid phase. 
If you have a reactor uh, that runs under supercritical conditions and you have a glass window and you look inside, when you pump uh, liquid CO2, first you have a clear boundary between the gas and liquid phases. As you heat uh, and pressurize the system simultaneously, this boundary disappears and you get to the single phase that is the supercritical phase. Supercritical fluids have high diffusivity and low viscosity, which are gas-like properties, and high solvatic property, which is a liquid-like property. SCFE does not generate hazardous wastewater and acid fumes, and if we use carbon dioxide as the solvent, it is cheap, abundant, safe, inert, and easy to vent or recycle. SCFE was developed in late 1970s to extract and produce high-value products and later on it was expanded to less specialized applications. Major commercial SCFE users are energy industry for direct liquefaction of coal and enhanced oil recovery from petroleum reserves and chemical industry, particularly food and pharmaceuticals, for example, for coffee decaffeination, vegetable oil production, extraction of organics like alcohols from aqueous solutions and regeneration of catalyst and activated carbon. This is the process uh, flow diagram of our system. Our reactor is manufactured by supercritical fluid technology in the United States, which is at the center of the flow sheet. We have a liquid CO2 pump, with pump which pumps uh, liquid CO2 to the system. We also have a co-solvent pump uh, that can pump co-solvents like methanol if we have a need for it in the process. Then uh, this is a jacketed reactor. The temperature and pressure are raised. And after the process is complete, the static dynamic valve and restrictor valve are opened. Uh, the system goes through the depressurization. CO2 can be vented or recycled. And the liquid phase that contains the target metals is collected in a glass vial. This is a top view of the reactor, which is 100 ml, and this is the whole system. This is the reactor, uh, this is the head, the reactor is inside uh, this jacket. This is the co-solvent pump, the CO2 pump, and the controller for temperature and agitation. There are several solvents that can be used as supercritical fluids. For example, carbon dioxide, water, methane, ethane, propane, and ethylene. In our study, we use carbon dioxide for its moderate critical temperature and pressure, which are 31 degrees C and 7 megapascal. Supercritical CO2 is a nonpolar solvent. Therefore, metal species must be charged neutral and coordinatively ready to dissolve in it. Metal ions, on the other hand, are positively charged, and they must be bonded with a negative ligand or a combination of negative and neutral ligands. The metal ligand complex is nonpolar and soluble in supercritical CO2. Here I'm showing an example of neodymium 3 plus, which is a polar ion, and it is bonded uh, and complex with TBP HNO3 adduct. We have three bidentate nitrate anions uh, surrounding this cation and three TBPs, and each TBP has three aliphatic chains. In this case, we form a reverse micelle that contains nine aliphatic chains pointing outward from this uh, from the reverse micelle. And this is a nonpolar compound that is soluble in nonpolar supercritical carbon dioxide. Now I'm going to present the results of recycling lithium, cobalt, nickel, and manganese from end-of-life lithium ion batteries of an electric vehicle using supercritical carbon dioxide. This project was conducted by Jikai Zhang, my former PhD student, and was published in RCR in 2022. The objectives of this study were to develop the SCFE process for extraction of lithium, nickel, cobalt, and manganese from end-of-life LIBs, to determine the optimum operating parameters, and to elucidate the extraction mechanism. This is the life cycle of an LIB used in EVs. After the battery comes out of the manufacturing company, it is used in electric vehicles. When it reaches the end of life, it can be sent to junkyards. It can go to refurbishing companies and find a second life as a stationary energy storage devices. 
and uh, be sent to raw, raw material extraction and processing after the second life or directly goes through material recycling and the materials that are recycled go to the manufacturing and uh, be put into a new battery pack. Conventional recycling processes uh, primarily comprises uh, pretreatment, uh, leaching, and product separation. Most previous studies have used pyro and hydrometallurgy for recycling of the battery. And in this process, in this study, we use supercritical fluid extraction for the recycling purposes. These are the images of the disassembly uh, of the battery. Uh, part A uh, shows the as received end of life lithium ion battery from Ecamion, the company. Here we have the pouch cell being cut by a ceramic scissor inside a glove box. Then we separated layers of cathode and anode after removing the case. And this is a single layer of the cathode that is uh, recovered. These are the steps for preparation of black mass uh, for the CFE process. After we separate the layers of cathode and current collector, we uh, store them and then dry them at 80, 80 degrees C for 24 hours. Then we use ultrasonication to separate the black mass from the current collector in, for two to three minutes in deionized water. Then we perform vacuum filtration to separate the black mass uh, from the liquid phase. The current collector and the active materials are se uh, separated from each other. We dry the black mass at 80 degrees C for 24 hours. Then we use mortar and pestle to re, uh, to uh, deagglomerate the particles and mix them in a vortex mixer for one to two minutes. Uh, we digested the black mass in Acoregia and measured the concentration of uh, metals uh, using inductive decoupled plasma optical emission spectroscopy or ICPOES. And this figure shows the composition in weight percent. We have 6.8 weight percent lithium, 13 weight percent cobalt, 18.9 weight percent manganese, and 23.2 percent um, nickel. We perform X-ray diffraction analysis of the cathode and the anode. The cathode comprises lithium cobalt manganese oxide in the form of lithium Mn.3 cobalt.3 nickel.3 oxide and some graphite. And the anode material uh, consists of 100% uh, graphite. We use design of experiment to design the experimental matrix. Here we looked at the effect of three operating parameters, temperature, pressure, and adduct to solid ratio. The ranges were uh, chosen based on uh, preliminary experiments and uh, our own experience of using this technique for other feeds. And uh, here uh, we set the agitation rate at 750 RPM and time was allowed to be one hour. After running the experimental matrix, the uh, extraction efficiency of all four metals was around 70%, which proves that uh, SCFE is a viable process to extract these four metals from end-of-life LIBs, but we need to increase uh, the extraction efficiency uh, to improve the economic and technical viability of the process. Here we utilized uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide as the reducing agent uh, and the amount was four volume percent and we performed the experimental matrix again and we observed that the extraction efficiency increased by 15 to 20 percent and we achieved an extraction efficiency of around 90 percent for all four metals. We perform empirical modeling uh, to investigate the effect of operating parameters on the extraction efficiency of target metals. These graphs uh, show the parameter effects. Any parameter uh, that is on the right-hand side of zero has a positive effect on extraction, and any parameter on the left has a negative impact, and if it crosses zero, it has insignificant uh, impact. Here we observe that X3, which is uh, the adduct to solid ratio, has the highest positive effect on the extraction efficiency of all four metals. The higher X3 means that we have more acid molecules available to react with 
the cathode material, liberating all four metals from this matrix. And also we have more TBP molecules to uh, chelate with the uh, metal nitrates forming the complex that is soluble in supercritical CO2. Here, the model can be used to predict the optimum operating parameters, which was determined to be 40 degrees C, 31 megapascal, one hour time, and five milliliter to gram ad hoc to solid ratio, and agitation rate of 750, which resulted in about 90% extraction efficiency of four, all four metals. An experiment was conducted under these operating conditions, and we achieved 87% lithium, 91% cobalt, 90% manganese, and 90% nickel. Uh, so the error between the prediction and the measured values is around 1%. Uh, we uh, determine the morphological and elemental mapping of uh, the metals in the uh, cathode material before and after the CFE process. We observe that the unprocessed cathode material consists of agglomerated particles with the smooth surfaces, whereas the residue after the CFE is highly porous. The elemental mapping uh, after uh, the extraction shows that most of uh, nickel, cobalt, and manganese is extracted, and the remaining material is basically carbon. We perform kinetic uh, study to investigate the process mechanism. So we uh, ran the test between zero to two hours, and this figure shows the extraction efficiency of all four metals versus time. You see that uh, we achieve uh, maximum extraction efficiency within 10 minutes, and the system reaches equilibrium. Uh, here we used a shrinking core model to determine the rate determining step, and we assume that two steps can be the rate determining step. The first is the diffusion of supercritical fluid uh, supercritical CO2 through the firm product or ash layer, or the chemical reaction between the solvent and the solid uh, particle surface. By plotting um, the relevant terms uh, versus time, we observe that uh, the rate determining step uh, for all four metals is the diffusion of the solvent through the ash layer. And following that, we use the RNUs equation to calculate the activ activation energy uh, for the reaction. And for all four metals, we calculated that to be less than 10 kilojoules per mole, further validating that the diffusion is the rate determining step because research has indicated that if activation energy is less than 20 kilojoules per mole, uh, the rate determining step is the diffusion through the ash layer. Otherwise, if the chemical reaction is the rate determining step, activation energy would be higher than 40 kilojoules per mole. We performed X-ray photo uh, electron spectroscopy to determine the reason behind the positive impact of hydrogen peroxide on the extraction efficiency. We looked at the spectrum for cobalt, manganese, and nickel uh, for samples with and without uh, H2O2 addition, these are the residue after the process. We observe that the content of manganese 2 is slightly higher than manganese 4 in the residue after a CFE without hydrogen peroxide, but when hydrogen peroxide was present, the amount of manganese 2 was three times higher than manganese 4. The oxidation state of nickel in the residue after SCFE without hydrogen peroxide was nickel-3, uh, but in the residue with uh, H2O2 is a combination of nickel-2 and nickel-3, but mostly nickel-2. So we observed that the addition of hydrogen peroxide in SCFE reduces cobalt, manganese, and nickel, and the metals in oxidation state 2 are more soluble in aqueous solution as well as uh, SCFE or supercritical CO2. We can also form stable cobalt nitrate TBP2 and cobalt nitrate 2 TB2, TBP2 complexes that are soluble in supercritical CO2. Here, the metal cations are centered in the complex with two bidentate nitrate ions and two coordinate bonds with uh, phosphoryl oxygen atoms in the TBP molecule. 
to elucidate the uh, to elucidate the mechanism behind the process, uh, we performed uh, some uh, investigation, and here we looked at six uh, samples. Uh, the sample was the black mass that we used for our experiments. In test one, we only used uh, nitric acid. In test two, we only used TBP. In test three, we used TBP HNO3 adduct. Test four, only supercritical CO2. Test five, we had the adduct and supercritical CO2. And test six, we had nitric acid and supercritical CO2. When we used only nitric acid 70%, we observed about 40% extraction of all four metals. When we used only TBP, no extraction was observed. With TBP HNO3 adduct, around 50% extraction was achieved. With supercritical CO2 alone, no extraction was achieved. The system with supercritical CO2 and the adduct, we obtained 40, uh, 70 to 77% extraction. And with nitric acid and supercritical CO2, uh, we achieved 45 uh, to 50% extraction, but it was an aqueous phase and nothing dissolved in supercritical CO2. So with this, uh, we concluded that uh, the process mechanism is a three-step process. The first step is the dissolution of metal oxide into metal ions using nitric acid and reduction of metal ions using hydrogen peroxide. The second step is the complexation of metal ion with TBP ligand. And the last step is extraction and dissolution of metal adduct complexes in supercritical CO2. Without nitric acid, no extraction was observed uh, in trial one to four because the dissociation of nitric acid facilitates the dissolution of metal oxide ions, uh, metal oxide to metal ions, as are shown in these two reactions. As shown in trial six, which was the last trial where we only had nitric acid and supercritical CO2, uh, no product was collected without TBP since aqueous phase cannot dissolve in the nonpolar supercritical CO2. In summary, uh, the SCFE method was able to improve the extraction efficiency of lithium, nickel, manganese, and cobalt compared with conventional leaching processes. Consumption of chemicals was significantly lowered. Acid to sample ratio required to achieve 90% extraction efficiency was reduced from 100 milliliter per gram to 5 milliliter per gram. And the amount of H2O2 was reduced from 8 to 10 volumetric percent to four volumetric percent. Also, the time required was five to six times shorter. Using supercritical CO2 can significantly improve the mass transfer process due to disappearance of the phase boundaries. The reducing agent, uh, which is H2O2, can significantly improve the extraction process by reducing cobalt, manganese, and nickel. And the XPS provided evidence that all three metals can be reduced to oxidation too, which makes them more soluble in aqueous solutions and forms uh, supercritical CO2 soluble complexes. This process, uh, this uh, work proposes a three-step mechanism for the CFE process. The first step is the dissolution of metal oxide into metal ions using nitric acid and reduction of metal ions using H2O2. The second step is the complexation of metal ions with TBP ligand. And the last step is extraction and dissolution of metal, metal adduct complexes in supercritical CO2. So this study ushers in an alternative recycling process for metal recovery from cathode material of, of end-of-life uh, lithium-ion batteries, and the findings offer valuable insight into the reaction mechanism, which lays the foundation for further development of SCFE processes. These are the highly qualified personnel who were involved in this project. Bill Yao, my master's student, former master's student. This study was particularly performed by Ji Kai Zhang, Dr. Ji Kai Zhang, who recently graduated. I also had Dr. John Anavati, Adrian Lambert, Nina, Erin Kimberly working on this project. And currently, my PhD student, Si Cheng Ling, is working on this process. And we are looking at supercritical fluid extraction of rare elements 
emissions from ore concentrates, so pr basically primary resources. At the end, I would like to thank uh, all my sponsors on various projects and my students who are the enabler uh, of the success stories in our research program. And thank you all uh, for your attention. I would be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Giselle, for that presentation. Very, very interesting. And I have to say, you absolutely nailed the accessibility aspect. I'm sure a lot of the viewers really appreciated the work that you put in at the start of the presentation and making sure that everything was really clear in terms of the background information. We actually do have a few questions here, so I suppose I'll just start straight there. You might even be able to read them yourself, but um, the first question is, your vessel volume is quite small. How long before scaling up to one ton per batch uh, or a continuous process is possible? A very uh, good question, and it makes uh, totally sense. Uh, we started this work in 2017, and it has been going on. We looked at different uh, feeds, uh, basically, for this system. And uh, we have grown this to a TRL level of four, and uh, now we have done a techno-economic analysis uh, for this system, particularly for recycling neodymium iron boron magnets and fluorescent lamps. And um, after the publication of this work in RCR, uh, a few companies contacted me, including Mitsubishi, a recycler in Norway, and another company in Chile. And they are all interested in funding the research to go towards the pilot plant, and uh, we are considering uh, those activities. So I envision uh, one to two years uh, during the piloting and uh, scaling up the process and then get uh, to the larger scale after that. Very nice. From the same, uh, same attendee, we have a question. Uh, is there a life cycle assessment for the environmental impacts of the process? Uh, no, we have not done uh, any LCA analysis, but uh, we have one study on TEA analysis, a detailed techno-economic analysis to show uh, the viability of the process. And um, I was hoping that uh, I have that published at RCR as well, because I uh, feel there is a very close relevance there. Uh, so I'm in the process of uh, submission and uh, publishing that work, and I expect it to become available in about two months, uh, considering the review process. But uh, specifically LCA, no, we have not done that. That's good news that to hear that you're returning to our journal. I'm looking forward to reading your research. Thank um, you. We have another question here. Uh, what is the cost associated with the SCFE in comparison with other hydrometallurgical processes? Uh, very good question. Um, it's uh, for sure a costly process, but when we performed the techno-economic analysis, uh, we determined that the composition of the uh, valuable target metal, for example, in the magnet was this prosium. Here in our case, uh, for the battery is cobalt, is the determining uh, factor uh, in the cost of the process, as well as the adduct uh, to solid ratio that we have to keep that uh, at the minimum stage. Uh, right now we are, this is an ongoing task that we are looking at it on daily basis. So we are performing tests to minimize uh, this ratio. And in that techno-economic analysis, we showed that when we did scenario analysis, under several scenarios, the process is economically viable and it has high return in investment. Um, so in terms of cost, it, it is a comparable process and it does not mean that it is uh, prohibitively expensive. Um, if I want to say which process is similar to this, at an industrial scale, I can say Hopper Bosch process. Our reactors are very similar to those because the pressure and our system is very similar to that pressure. The only difference is that our temperature is significantly lower. They are looking at higher than 300. We are looking at below 50 degrees C. Thank you. The other question, uh, what is the influence of hydrogen peroxide on the reactor? What are the measurements taken to avoid the corrosion of the vessel? Uh, 
uh, it did not affect uh, or cause any corrosion in the system um, in the stainless steel um, 316 that we have. The amount used is quite small, uh, but we need to have a hydrogen peroxide uh, based on our uh, analysis uh, because we need to bring the metals into the lowest uh, oxidation stage, uh, which results in the highest solubility or formation of complexes with highest solubility in supercritical CO2. We even observed that in uh, our hydrometallurgical studies of uh, recycling lithium ion batteries, when we use uh, sulfuric acid as the leaching agent, uh, we need to add a few percentage of hydrogen peroxide and similar to this study, when we performed XPS uh, studies, we identified that we are reducing the metals and they are more uh, soluble in, in acid in that case. And in this case that we are talking today in supercritical CO2. You've already spoken a little about it, but we have another, another attendee that's interested in the industrial application of SCFB. Uh, process compared to conventional hydrometallurgy and pyrometallurgy processes. Perhaps you have a couple of extra notes that you wanted to add? For sure. Uh, so this is a very uh, new topic. Um, so investigation on using SCF for rare earth extraction uh, started in 1990s and uh, there were a few groups that looked at the recovery of rare earth elements from mixed oxides, synthetic oxides. And in uh, 2016, uh, I decided to apply this unreal feed and use that for recycling of uh, materials from secondary resources. And we started with rare earths as well, with nickel metal hydride battery, neodymium iron boron magnet, fluorescent lamps, and uh, we are very advanced on those feeds. And uh, after that was successful, I wasn't sure if that would work for lithium ion batteries. I mean, our lithium cobalt nickel manganese also responsive uh, to, to chelation and to supercritical CO2. And we saw that, yes, uh, they are uh, promising. So the field is quite new and at infancy, but I think we have had success stories uh, showing uh, the feasibility of this process with high extraction efficiency and considering the benefits that it can uh, offer to us in terms of environment and, and cost, it's, it's a promising technology to be looked at uh, further and the potential industrialization is there because as you know, there are industrial plants that are using SCFE for other applications. So it's quite possible to be uh, extended for uh, recycling purposes. And also the work that we are doing on techno-economic analysis is quite promising and it's telling us that um, we have chosen the right path. So I think we are uh, on a good path and uh, I will continue working on this to see if we can increase the TRL level and potentially in few years, uh, if this can be commercialized. Uh, we are not eliminating hydrometallurgy or pyrometallurgy or underscoring that at all. I think this is just an alternative that could have promise uh, in case somebody is looking at establishing a new uh, plant for recycling purposes. Then uh, we're going to finish up in a moment, but uh, there were a couple of uh, final questions. Uh, on the sustainability of the process. I suppose you talked about things about energy efficiency compared to pyrometallurgical process and things like that. Were there any other notes you wanted to add on sustainability? Uh, I think it's quite sustainable. Uh, I have a few sentences to add there. Uh, the good thing is this process does not generate CO2. We can get CO2 from air and use that as a solvent. So somehow it's carbon negative. We can capture CO2 and use it as a as a a resource for us and uh, CO2 is completely recyclable in this process and the adduct is also recyclable and recoverable. So in terms of waste generation, it's quite minimal and uh, it has CO2 uh, capture capacity. So it seems uh, to be a sustainable process. And the final question, uh, can we use SCFE for NDFEB magnets? Yes, uh, we used that uh, for uh, magnets in 2018. 
uh, and I have a few papers published on that as well. Uh, if you look at my website, uh, azimilab.com, uh, on the publication page, you can find those papers and you can uh, look at them. But it's, yeah, new memory and Bora Magnet is a very good fit for that. Wonderful. And the remaining comments are just praise for your talk. Thank you so much, Giselle. Uh, so that brings us to the conclusion. I will just quickly um, make a couple of notes on the next webinar in our series. Um, <clears throat> Oh, I've got to move that box. So uh, on Thursday, the 18th of May, you may want to join us again to hear from uh, Joan uh, Munoz Lisa from the Autonomous University of Barcelona in Spain, who is going to be speaking with us on the topic of uh, how greenhouse building materials influence lifetime crop yields and environmental impacts. So, um, a big thank you so much to uh, Giselle for your presentation. It was very interesting. I personally really enjoyed it. And it seems that the viewers also found it very interesting. So thank you very much to you. Thank you also to the viewers for joining us. And uh, I hope to see you all next time. Thank you very much for the invitation. And thank you very much to audience for, for their attention. Uh, I greatly appreciate it. Okay. Until next time, then. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.